This Freedom Stories discussion is being recorded for use by the International Storytelling Center, ISC. This recording will be owned and managed by ISC and will be used for any educational purpose that ISC deems appropriate. By participating in this public discussion, you acknowledge this recording and its subsequent uses. Closed captioning is provided today by ACS. Freedom Stories, Unearthing the Black Heritage of Appalachia is proudly supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities and produced by the International Storytelling Center.
Good afternoon and welcome to our first Freedom Stories of the new year. Um, I'm Alistair Turley, Director of the International Storytelling Center's Freedom Stories Project. And today's discussion will be exploring the strange career of Jim Crow, a very timely topic for today's events. And as we talk, hopefully you'll see many of the similarities or uh, can relate to many of the stories that you see appearing in today's news as really not new news at all. So the Freedom Stories Project, uh, for those of you who've been following us, you realize that it is a it's a project sponsored by the International Storytelling Center. And the initiative is designed to eliminate the underappreciated and overlooked histories of African Americans in Central Appalachia. And this project marries together the folk art of storytelling with the humanities scholarship. The idea is to guide the public through a deeper appreciation of the role of African Americans in the creation of American culture, especially American culture we experience today. It was originally conceived to be a focus on Central Appalachia. However, the toolkit and the electronic, electronic media that we've developed is available and accessible to the entire country. We're eager to highlight the diversity of our Appalachian communities, the complexities of Appalachian histories, and the role the region has played in American history, all of which has been subject to misunderstanding and stereotypes. The International Storytelling Center is aided in being able to present this project to you through funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, who is the major funder of the Freedom Stories Project. Today's discussions uh, are recorded, as are all of our Freedom Stories, and they are available and will remain available on YouTube, the International Storytelling Center's uh, Facebook page, and the International Storytelling Center website. Uh, I would encourage viewers, if you're viewing, listening, and you have questions for anyone, our storyteller or uh, panelists, please just uh, text us on Facebook and we'll try our best to answer as many of your questions as possible and as time permits. So as we, our next Freedom Stories uh, will be February 13th. So we'll be watching the International Storytelling Center website for the most updated information on what that will be like. So today, just as we do each time, we will start our discussion with the story. And so we're very happy today to have with us one of America's premier storytellers, Mitch Capel, Mitchell Capel. Mitch Capel's journey as a professional storyteller, motivational speaker, poet, playwright, and comedian began professionally in 1985. And he is now considered the national interpreter of the poet laureate, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and he has committed over 70% of poets of Dunbar's work to memory. Performing under the stage name of Granddaddy Junebug, a character that he created for children, Mitchell calls his style of storytelling stoetry because the majority of his stories are in rhyme. For the past 36 years, this award-winning artist has traveled both nationally and internationally, performing as different one-man shows from historical to inspirational storytelling at schools, libraries, festivals, and thousands of other venues. He has been featured at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, the National Association of Black Storytellers Festival, the Kennedy Center, the National Storytelling Festival, and of course, for the first inauguration of President Barack Obama. He did his first comedy stand-up with Showtime at the Apollo, hosted by Steve Harvey. So we're very fortunate today to be joined by Mitchell Cable. Thank you. Thank you very much, 
Dr. Charlie, for that very warm introduction. <clears throat> Pardon me. And uh, who better to enlighten us about the times of Jim Crow other than the poets who actually lived during that time? So I'll start off with Paul Dunbar's We Wear the Mask, where he simply said, we wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. <laughs> we smile. But, oh, great God, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, lift every voice and sing. But, oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. <laughs> His first book, Oak and Ivy, he published a poem called Going Back, <clears throat> where he said he stood beside the station rail, a Negro aged and bent and frail, his palsied hands like the aspen shook, a mute appeal was in his look, his every move was pained and slow. His matted hair, white as snow. He noticed our questioning looks and said with the solemn shake of his order head, I know you're wondering and where you may. Well, old man like me is grind today. I lived in this town for 30 years. Know the life is joy and tears. I labored hard year out year in. Now I'm going back again to the bluegrass meadows and the fields of corn in the dear old state where I was born. The same old tale that I has to tell in these but few of my race but knows it well. <coughs> when first the proclamation come, I felt too free to stay at home. Freedom, it seemed, was a gift divine, and it seemed the whole wide world was mine. Then I was fried, and my hair was black, and this troublesome creek wasn't in my back. My soul was always full of song cause my heart was light and my limbs were strong. And I wasn't afraid to show my face to the studies work on the place. <laughs> but I caught the fever that ruled the day and finally Norfolk made my way. They say that things was bad enough and a man was held to his honest worth. Well, that may be so, but I have some doubt. In 30 years, I ain't knocked it out. <coughs> oh, there's lots of things in the North to admire. Though they hadn't the warmth and passion and fire that all my life I been used to seeing and thought belonged to a human being. And the one thing I did surely miss was that real old Southern heartiness. Well, year after year, I worried alone. While deep in my heart, the yearning strong grew stronger and fiercer to visit once more the well-loved scenes of my native show. 
but money was scarce. Time went on. Now, a full 30 years gone, and I turned my weary steps to Rome, back to my old Kentucky home, back to the old Kentucky sights, back to the scenes of my youth delight, back where my soul was filled with glee, back. Where I first found liberty. Now, as I think the old times o'er, and of the joy they held in store. Yes, even now, on life's dark side, my heart swells out with honest pride. Oh, bless the Lamb that I shall see once more. The land so dear to me. Don't mind an old man's tears, but say it's joy. He's going back today. I'm on my way to Canaan land. I'm on my way to Canaan land. And then we have the Reverend Walter Brooks, who on September 15th, 1900, wrote a poem called The Jim Crow Car, where he said, this too is done to crush me, but not can keep us back. My place, forsooth a section twix smoker, front and back, while others ride in coaches full large and filled with light, and this our Southern Christians insist is just and right. There, yellow man from China and red man from the plain are seated with the white man, but I could not remain. However clean my person, my linen and my life, they snarl. Yo, your car ahead, Jim. Go there and take your wife. We're singled out from the others a mark for shafts of scorn here, huddled like the tamed cattle from early night till morn. The golden rules rejected, who cares for such a thing? Do they whose prejudice or race inflict this bitter sting? This insult almost kills me. God help me bear the wrong. Well, mine's the story of the weak who falls before the strong, who fall to rise in triumph when God his sword shall gird and the proudest evildoer shall tremble at his word. Fast forward to 1947, great poet Langston Hughes talked about it in Freedom Train. I read in the papers about the Freedom Train. I heard on the radio about the Freedom Train. I seen folks talking about the Freedom Train. Lord, I've been waiting for the Freedom Train. Washington, Richmond, Durham, Chattanooga, Atlanta, way across Georgia. Lord, 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 way down in Dixie, the only trains I see's got Jim, Jim Crow, Jim Crow coaches set aside for me. I hope there ain't no Jim Crow on the Freedom Train, no backdoor entrance on the Freedom Train, no sign for colored on the Freedom Train, no white folks only on the Freedom Train. I'm going to check up. I'm going to check up on this freedom train. Who is the engineer on the freedom train? Can a cold black man drive the freedom train? Or am I still a porter on the freedom train? Is there ballot boxes on the freedom train? Do colored folks vote on the freedom train when it stops in Mississippi? Will it be made plain? Everybody's got a right to board the freedom train. I'm going to check up. 
I'm going to check up on this freedom train. The Birmingham stations mark colored and white. The white folks go left and the colored go right. They even got a segregated lane. Is that the way to get aboard the freedom train? I'm going to check up. I'm going to check up on this freedom train. If my children ask me, Daddy, please explain why a Jim Crow station for the freedom train? What should I tell my children? You tell me, because freedom ain't freedom when a man ain't free. My brother Jimmy died in Anzio. He died for real, and it wasn't no show. Is this here freedom on the freedom train really freedom or a show again? Now let the freedom train come zooming down the track, gleaming in the sunlight for white and black, not stopping at no stations marked color or white, just stopping in the fields in the broad daylight, stopping in the country in the wide open air where there never was a Jim Crow sign nowhere and no lily white committees, politicians of note, nor poll tax layer through which color can't vote. And there won't be no kind of color lines. The freedom train will be yours and mine. Then maybe from their graves in Anzio, black men and white will say, we want it so. Black men and white will say, ain't it fine? At home, they got a freedom train, a freedom train that's yours and mine. Fast forward to 1964, a student by the name of Florence Seymour, Gulfport, was published in the Freedom School Poetry for SNCC. Why do they hate us? What has the Negro done? It's enough to make you wonder. It's enough to make you cry that every race hates the Negro. Good Lord, I wonder why. You can travel and travel. You can travel this country through. You'll find every race hates the Negro, no matter what they do. You can scrub and mop the kitchens and work from morning till night, but every race hates the Negro and just won't treat them right. You can wash and shine their cars and have their meals ready when they come. Now tell me, why do they hate us? What has the Negro done? They say that monkeys are our ancestors, the beginning of our race, but we have never killed a president. Kip kidnapping children is out of our place. We are Jim Crowed on every corner and everywhere we go, not only in the South, but clear to the White House though. We are Jim Crowed on the trains and in the restaurants when we want a meal, but they never Jim Crowed the Negro when he was on the battlefield. They won't allow us to have our business. Nowhere in the heart of town. And if we own too fine a home, they will come and burn it down. We have to live in rat dens and huts on the edge of town. It doesn't matter where we live, they mean to keep us down. They pay us the lowest salaries and work us almost for fun. Now tell me why they hate us, Lord. What has the Negro done? Raymond Garfield Dandridge <clears throat> was born in 1882 and transitioned in 1930. Wrote a piece called Brother Mine, where he simply said, prejudice with venom smote in every word and act. Snuffed was the light of knowledge from your view. Unbefriended martyr, sole object of attack. Has your fair brother fairly dealt with you, brother mine? Upon defenseless womanhood he prayed, then freely chattled blood one half his own. Just punishment has only been delayed. Tis written, ye shall reap as ye have sown, brother mine. In doctored balance, justice balanced you. In your defense, her vengeful sword ne'er stirred. Courts of law, barring facts, basing guilt on hue, condemn you before the evidence is even heard. Brother mine, your constant prayer that you might prove your worth for equal right to struggle, live, and die. So long unheard, unheeded here on earth, 
found audience in one beyond the sky. Brother mine, vengeance is mine, I will repay, so saith the Lord. Thusly assured, real not at destiny. To righteousness he promised just reward, and to the bondman he promised liberty. Brother mine. And then we had Sterling Brown, who was born in 1903 and made transition in 1989, where he talked about strong men. They dragged you from homeland. They chained you in cuffles. They huddled you spoon fashion in filthy hatches. They sold you to give a few gentlemen ease. They broke you in like oxen. They scourged you. They branded you. They made your women breeders. They swelled your numbers with bastards. They taught you the religion they disgraced. You sang, keep an inch and a long like a poor inch worm. You sang, by and by, I'm going to lay down this heavy load. You sang, walk together, children. Don't you get weary. The strong men keep coming on. The strong men get stronger. They point with pride to the roads you built for them. They ride in comfort over the rails you laid for them. They put hammers in your hands and said, drive so much before sundown. You sang. Ain't no hammer huh, in this land. Ha! Strike like mine, baby. Ha! Strike like mine. Ha! They cooped you in their kitchens. They pinned you in their factories. They gave you the jobs that they were too good for. They tried to guarantee happiness to themselves by shunting dirt and misery to you. You sang, me and my baby gonna shine, shine. Me and my baby gonna shine. Strong men keep coming on. The strong men get stronger. They bought off some of your leaders. You stumbled as blind men will. They coaxed you unwantedly soft voiced. You followed away, <laughs> then laughed as usual. <laughs> They heard the laugh and wondered, uncomfortable, unadmitting a deeper terror. The strong men keep a coming on, the strong men getting stronger. What from the slums where they have hemmed you? What from the tiny huts they could not keep from you? What reaches them making them ill at ease, fearful? Today they shout prohibitions at you. Thou shalt not this, thou shalt not that, reserved for whites only. You laugh. <laughs> <clears throat> One thing they cannot prohibit. The strong men keep coming on. The strong men getting stronger. Strong men, stronger. Fast forward. <clears throat> November 4th, 2008, when Barack Hussein Obama was elected president of these United States, the poet in me came out and I wrote a piece called the election slide as opposed to the electric slide. And it went like this, the ancestors are dancing with the living. Even those whose decision it was to drown in the Atlantic are ecstatically sliding electionally on the ocean's floor to a syncopathic babatunde African drumbeat with a spattering of Ella scattering while Negro spirituals sing back up on drums is Roach, monks on piano with his Thelonious approach, Miles is on horn with Dizzy and Satchmo, chanting hypnotically is Geronimo, 
while Mr. Bojangles and little Sammy and even old Uncle Ben and I ain't your mammy are smiling as they filing down the soul train line. This time is now, this time is here. Mud dear and all those who fear the dogs and the hoses and the whips have a new dip in their hip and a new glide in their stride as they slide and move with the audacity of a hope group realized while singing the chorus, yes we can and yes we did as a new day dawns over pyramids with the prophecy fulfilled. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Fast forward to November 7th, 2020, a few days after the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. <clears throat> I again went to Penn and I wasn't gonna tell this, but in light of what's going on right now, I, I have to read this to you, <clears throat> pardon me. It's called Divide. When Barack Obama was selected, we thought we had elected to pull all of our differences aside. In this United We Stand, states of America's land, not forget, but discuss what divides. But not all were ecstatic. Some were doggedly emphatic to stay divided we fall. Cause in 2016, America selected a mean tyrannical, narcissistic screwball. This fraction could not stand for an American African presiding or the land of the free. So for eight years, they schemed and plotted to destroy the dream fulfilled by a human of destiny. So here we are, four years later, after this megalomaniac dictator redivided these states united, we have gone and selected, cast our votes and elected to correct a democracy blighted. It's an about time good feeling. Uh, Kamala broke some glass ceilings, a woman of color and biracially, uh, she was far, by far the best choice. Now over 75 million rejoiced cause she's now our Madam VP. But let's not forget, this country is divided still yet. Its history gives away the suspense. There is pause to be elated because hope has been jaded by 70 million who voted against. Narratives must come from within to discuss and uncover the sin that causes this crater vast and wide. America's wound will never heal until it is opened and revealed to drain the pus and the poison inside. Let's pray future generations of all walks and all stations won't shed their ancestral tears and this tsunami of a tide with its ebb and flow divide narrows and completely disappears. Now I'm gonna backtrack because I don't wanna leave with that last poem. I want this to be the last poem again in light of what has happened over the last few days. It's Langston Hughes and how relevant it is today. It's called Let America Be America Again. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plane seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dream. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. 
I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean. Hungry yet today, despite the dream. Beaten yet today, oh pioneers. I am the man who never got ahead. The poorest worker bartered through the years. I am the one who dreamt the basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turn that, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I am the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I am the one who left dark Ireland shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lay. And torn from Black Africa's strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today. The millions shot down when we strike. The millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we dreamed and all the songs we've sung and, and all the the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung. The millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again. The, the land that never has been yet and yet must be the land where every man is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's. Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand on the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. For those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangsters death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch, for that wonderful, those wonderful words. Um, I want to introduce our next commenter for today. We are fortunate to have joining in today's conversation, Dr. Stephen Nash, who is Associate Professor of History at Eastern East Tennessee State University in Johnson City, Tennessee. Uh, Dr. Nash earned his master's degree in history from Western Carolina University in 2001 and his PhD from the University of Georgia in 2009. He is the author of Reconstruction's Ragged Edge, The Politics of Post-War Life in the Mountain South, which uh, was published in 2016, which received the Weatherford Award for Nonfiction from Berea College and the Appalachian Studies Association. He also serves as president of the Mountain History and Culture Group and nonprofit support group for the Zebulon B. Vance Birthplace Historic, State Historic Site in Weaverville, North Carolina. 
So welcome to today's conversation, Steve, and thank you for agreeing to join us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I really appreciate it and what an act to follow. That was incredible. Thank you. I know. Much. Following a storyteller is tough. I'm <laughs> telling you. <laughs> it's always yeah. difficult. And with someone like Mitch, it's even more difficult. But I want to start by just talking so much in his poetry. Oh, my God. Working class uh, uh, discussions, uh, the poor, and this idea of who deserves privileges of freedom. So, so let me pose this question to you both. Um, what's different now? I mean, this poetry, Mitch, is from the early 1900s, but it's very relevant to what we see happening today. So when you were developing and learning this poetry and looking at what's happening in society now, what thoughts came through your mind? Well, first of all, it was that, uh, you know, as far as Dunbar's concerned, and probably the other poets as well, as they lived through this, and, and they were actually giving us the history uh, without it being sugar-coated, whereas, you know, it's straight from them. But what stands out most, is, again, is that it has not changed. I mean, nothing has changed. I think William Faulkner said the past is not dead. In fact, the past is not even the past. So we are still evolving as a human race, but uh, as far as, you, we have to understand that Jim Crow was only yesterday. It's not like it was a million years ago. This was only yesterday. I mean, it was, you know, and so we're still feeling the ramification. We're still feeling, uh, you know, what, what has happened to us then is still happening to us now. So nothing's really changed. Steve, as a scholar, you, you teach this topic. Mm -hmm. So what was it about La Paul Lawrence Dunbar's time and the way Mitch presented it and what you can tell us about Appalachia, Central Appalachia today in today's times. Well, I mean, I, I would sort of echo what he just said, which is, you know, the past is not even the past yet. Um, you know, it's one of the things that sort of echoes from the beginning is that America is an idea um, and it's been imperfectly realized through its history, but that hasn't prevented the continued effort to realize it and that it has not been America to everybody. Um, but, you know, the competing definitions over freedom and what freedom means, you know, we, we listen to our political leaders and others sort of talk about freedom and liberty as if they're monolithic and singular and, and neglecting the fact that they are um, concepts that have been frequently competed over and that there have been different definitions of what freedom mean at different times to different people. And that I think that there's a, there's a sort of core tension that continues to exist even to the present over who gets access to power, who gets to define freedom uh, and, and what that means to everybody in the United States. Well, based on what we're seeing, this argument, certainly from the Southern perspective under Reconstruction, there was a very definite idea about who freedoms belong to, and it definitely did not belong to people of color. So this, this concept of America as a white man's country. Uh, talk a little bit about how we see that playing out even now, safe with events that happened on Wednesday, for me, it was very clear that that was the statement that was being made when there were no boundaries that were beyond being breached. You know, the, the Capitol, we, we hold that sacred, but if you feel that you own the Capitol and the Capitol has no meaning unless you happen to be a white male who's free to go about doing whatever they want, but uh, restricted to everyone else. I mean, how, how, do we, how do you address that as an academic? How do you bring that to the forefront? Um, I'm gonna figure that out as the semester goes along. Um, yeah, it, 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 the, the landscape shifted, right? I mean, it, it's been building. You can't say that it hasn't been building and it's been coming. And in terms of parallels to reconstruction, they're abundant. Uh, and, and you know, when I started the research that became 
my first book, when it became my book, it started as a master's thesis in 1998, 1999. So, you know, long fruition on the project. You know, the sort of landscape that we're living in now, the climate that we're in now was to me somewhat un unimaginable in, in 98, 99. Um, the issues over uh, equality and liberties and continued sort of struggles over political rights were very relevant. But the sort of steady escalation uh, over the last decade, um, certainly over the last five, six years, um, I was giving a talk to a local radio station about uh, Zebulon Vance and his place in history on this day that Steve Scalise and members of Congress were shot. We've been seeing bombers and threats and uh, everything else over the last couple of years. And of course, the sort of steady reassertion of a sort of white supremacist violence, uh, which has never been distant from America's history, but is certainly surging. Um, I, I, you know, in, in sort of thinking about today, though, I also wanted to sort of caution against sort of leading with that. Like, I, I feel like when we talk about Reconstruction, it's easy to sort of view Reconstruction, where it gets often sort of depicted as this um, sort of break in American history, that, you know, this was the sort of heavy, violent, uh, sort of as the early historians of the late 19th, early 20th century would describe it, sort of the crime against the South. Um, in December, I, I, the group that I work with, uh, the site that I support, um, that the group supports Mountain History and Culture Group, the Zebulon Vance Birthplace State Historic Site, the staff there works really hard to tell a broad and inclusive history. And they do a program every holiday, every December now, called an Appalachian Christmas Carol, in which they sort of put people in a position of listening to the story of uh, Venus, an enslaved woman owned by the Vance family, and sort of following her path from slavery to freedom and into Jim Crow. And one of the things that struck me seeing the program again is not to lose sight of the sort of effort and the optimism and hope that came with emancipation and that sort of early shift into uh, the transition from slavery. And it it, you know, struck me this week, uh, the first part of Wednesday, prior to the uh, storming of the Capitol, Georgia, you know, the, the efforts on the part of Stacey Abrams mm -hmm. and people to sort of organize and mobilize, in particular, voters of color and, and working class voters in a way that shifted the landscape politically, right? Raphael Warnock being the first African-American senator from the state of Georgia. Um, that sort of political mobilization of the African-American population was a central part of the story of Reconstruction. It's one of the reasons why the violence in Jim Crow later is because they were so successful right, exactly. during Reconstruction. And, and that was true in Appalachia as well, where we tend to think of the African-American population as such a small percentage of the population. And numerically, that may be true. But politically, during Reconstruction, they swung the region politically. In, in my research, in particular, in Western North Carolina, critical counties, Buncombe County, where Asheville is located, swings to the Republicans because of Black voters, Black male voters in 1868. So that, that sort of transition, and, and to get back to the competing notions of freedom, right? Black Southerners had their own definition of freedom and what they wanted, and they asserted it during Reconstruction. And they, they were successful. That's what brings the backlash, the counter-revolution. Um, exactly. And I would say that that is what, ex what we're seeing today, is a backlash to uh, Stacey Abrams and... Yeah. Uh, the organization of voters in Georgia would shift control of the Congress. Uh, I would say uh, Joe Biden's speech uh, uh, when he accepted saying he owed a debt to African-Americans. I'm sure there were 74 million people in the country who did not wish to hear that. Right. Uh, so there is quite a bit that is very much reminiscent of Reconstruction and this idea of opening America up to many more people that before had been so well controlled. 
And so here we are now again in this century, reliving some of our past, trying to understand and get to higher ground. And so Mitch, how, how was Dunbar's poetry received during this time? He's writing, you know, during this time period of reconstruction. Yes, yeah, he was very well received. Uh, he was friends with uh, Frederick Douglass who called him the most promising young colored man in America. Um, uh, he wrote in uh, standard English, but the publishers were only one in his dialect poetry. And uh, um, he actually uh, wrote a little poem called The Poet, where he said that um, uh, he sang of life serenely sweet with now and then a deeper note from some high peak, not yet remote, he voiced the world's absorbing beat. He sang of love when earth was young and love itself within his lays, but ah, the world that turned to praise a jingle in a broken tongue. So, yeah, so, so, but it, even in his dialect poetry, uh, which I love because it, the dialect is, he took the language of, 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 of American Africans. I don't say African American, I say American Africans. Uh, he took the language of our African ancestors that, that had been, they were trying to understand this English language. And, and he spells that D-A-T. And that's the way we speak. That's the way we spoke in Africa because there's no T-H sound in the African dialect. It's that, them, they, those. So it's like a different language and a lot of people can't read the dialect, but even in his dialect writings, he stood for uh, social, uh, he was socially conscious and he stood up for, uh, for, for African-Americans, for American Africans. It's hard for me to get back to where I was. Uh, on that, and um, he stood up for us in, in several poems, even in dialect, he still, he still talked about how, uh, you know, uh, in Dealey, she's pure colored, don't you see, that's just what's the matter, that's why I love her so, there ain't no mix about her, you know, and, uh, you know, so he, he, was, he was very prolific in his writing, and, and he, wrote a, he wrote plays, he did write a, uh, a minstrel show, uh, Clarendi, with Marion Cook, and it appeared in Broadway on, in 1898. And uh, that's where the term who dat comes from. Cause he said, who dat got chicken? It was the popular song in the play. So there's a controversy about 10, 10 years ago about uh, New Orleans Saints fans saying who dat, who dat? They thought it was, it was uh, kind of uh, derogatory but uh, they traced it back to Dunbar's poetry back in the day. So. Well, and this idea, again, I think if you see the slideshow, how uh, what struck me about this period is the whole concept of a minstrel show, which really has never really gone away. It became vaudeville, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. this idea of white face becoming black face and making a fortune off imitating the black language and the black dance and the black patois, all of that. Uh, so it's always been a part of our culture, but it was surprising that we as African Americans believe that this somehow was a creation we um, became responsible for. You know, that was the rap of the day. The minstrel show was the rap of that period. And so what, yeah. what about this idea of Dunbar? Did he profit as did the Christie minstrels and all these others? Was his show a success? His so, show was a success and he used all black actors, but there was no makeup. They weren't in black face or they weren't in white face. They were black actors being black <laughs> actors. <laughs> so, uh, uh, in Harlem primarily or touring? He was in Broadway. He was on Broadway. Broadway. Uh, yeah, he was, it was on Broadway uh, at the rooftop casino something uh, theater, uh, Broadway. So anyway, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, Dunbar was such a prolific writer. He, you know, his Ode to Ethiopia is one of my favorite poems and, you know, where he defends uh, our race of people, you know, because he had gone to, a, 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 he had gone to, a, invited to speak one night <clears throat> at the West, at the, the, I think it was called the West End Club. And he was the only African-American in the room. And the guy that, uh, uh, there was a guy speaking who had just traveled to the South and he was up speaking to the group about the Negro in the South and he was, saying we were shiftless and lazy and talking about us like a dog. You know how they talk about us I'm like we ain't there. But he didn't know Dunbar was in the room. And so when the gentleman invited him and in, in, invited Dunbar to speak, 
I introduced him. Of course, the other gentleman was, was readily embarrassed, but Dunbar got up and he recited an ode to Ethiopia where he stood there and, and defended uh, everything about us. And, uh, and I thought that's when he became my hero, my champion, because he could have been lynched. He could have been killed that night. He was by himself, the only African-American there. And he had to get on his mule and ride back home <laughs> by himself. But, but, he, but he had courage. And that's, what I, that's, what, that's really what gravitated me towards him. Uh, even more when I read that story about Dunbar. Right, and this idea of violence. This uh, We were talking about this, Steve, yesterday on Wednesday when we saw the violence in the Capitol and uh, I, five people dead from this, I don't really even know what to call it, insurrection. I, I don't know what how you're going to term this, but this this is a very violent period in American history. How would you compare it to what we see happening today? Are we any better off at managing this? Should we turn the other cheek? Should Biden prosecute? I mean, how? what was happening in this violent period? Yeah, it, you know, I, I once heard a lecture from a noted um, Civil War Reconstruction scholar by the name of Stephen Hahn. And he made the comment to the audience, which was, um, you know, Reconstruction is always portrayed as an anomaly, as this sort of hiccup in American history where, you know, everything's sort of been compromised and political peace. And then Reconstruction comes and it's violent. And then we kind of put it back in its box and move on. And his question to the audience was, what if Reconstruction is the norm? What, what if that is kind of the normal within mm. American political wow. history? And, and there is... I think validity and certainly the question needs to be reckoned with by people in terms of the level of political violence in American history and reconstruction. It's undeniable that it's one of the most violent political periods in American history. And it's, and it was targeted and it was, you know, specifically cultivated and um, came about at a particular time for a particular reason, which was um, that African-American men were, sort of enabled to vote in 1867, uh, even before the 15th Amendment. They voted in 1868 elections across the former Confederate states, winning a Republican majority for pretty much all of those states. And then um, there's sort of this notion that uh, Ku Klux during Reconstruction sort of believed that the, the new governments were somehow illegitimate because of the fact that they were you know, elected by a sort of uh, composition of poor whites and unionists and sort of disaffected white elites who had sort of drifted away from the Confederacy and, of course, black men, so that they turned towards counter-revolutionary violence and um, were incredibly effective at it. And, and one of the things that, you know, social media sort of makes this resonate to me in, in a profound way which is one of the things that was so disturbing about the Reconstruction Era Klan was the extent to which they were able to essentially disguise themselves. And I don't mean literally, I mean in the public imagination that newspaper editors denied their existence. Right. You know, they downplayed it. And, and you have testimony coming out of white Republicans, like a white Republican in Rutherford County, North Carolina, who's attacked multiple times, beaten. One observer called him the most abused piece of human flesh I've ever seen. You know, you have, you know, black men who are being attacked in the middle of the night. Albion Torje, who is an Ohio Republican who is in North Carolina, writes a book and just calls from page after page after page of Senate accumulated testimony of people being tortured, intimidated, black men being castrated, people being murdered. Alamance, North County, Alamance County, North Carolina is very much in the news these days. Um, uh, African-American Republican by the name of White Outlaw was lynched on the town square. And that town square is the same town square where you now have people rallying to defend a Confederate monument. And you have this sort of effort to convince people that they didn't exist. Newspaper editors saying that the Republicans and black people were doing this to themselves to try to garner sympathy in the North. Nowadays, a certain segment of the population would call that fake news. And, mm -hmm. and you would hear disinformation and misinformation and people 
claiming that these groups don't exist or that the people who we cl plainly see photographed moving through the United States Capitol in what is being dubbed, I think, accurately an insurrection. You see people moving through, being photographed, who we can document who they are, and you still have people saying, but that, those were plants, right? This isn't true. Right. Like what we can see and read and understand with our own eyes, we're being told is incorrect or untrue. There's a strong parallel between that and what happened during Reconstruction with the Ku Klux and their ability to topple some of these democratically elected Republican, at the time, Republican state governments in the South. Exactly. They were extremely successful and some would say still remain so. When we look at the exclusionary politics in Alabama, you know, there are uh, Georgia, the way to exclude voters, uh, the fact that Congress lifted, uh, said that they no longer needed to be controlled by federal government to make sure that yep. voting rights are protected. This exactly what happened under Johnson in Reconstruction. When I, when I was putting yep. that PowerPoint together, it was like, wow, you know, this idea of voter uh, suppression, suppression. Yep. what we call it now, voter suppression, but it, it's very much a part of the American agenda. And I don't wanna just, uh, Steve, you made a good point. This was just not a Southern idea. You know, I, I have to always, for each one of these conversations, I call it an American scheme because the North was just as complicit as the South. Um, I think when we're teaching this topic, we always focus on the South, but the South could not have done any of this had the North not been very complicit and in agreement with everything that the South was doing. They feared the Black vote just as much. So what can you tell us about that? I mean, we, we see um, Kentucky born, Lexington born D.W. Griffith who becomes a national hero because of Birth of a Nation. And sure. just here two years ago, they wanted to give him a, walk, a star uh, on the Walk of Honor in Lexington and the community really rose up against it, but so many people didn't even understand why. They kept mm -hmm. saying, well, he pioneered the modern theater. So they totally overlooked the aspect of racism in the Klan. <laughs> so yeah. what do we do? What do, how do we respond to that as teachers? Uh, you know, one of the things that I always have to cling to, and I do fervently believe, and this is built out of a... Um, career now as a historian, both in research and teaching, and also having spent some time as a Park Service interpreter early on in my career and working with public history people, I believe people can handle complexity. I mean, I, I really do believe that, that when you talk to people and you listen to people and you have conversations, that they can handle complexity and they can handle the idea that things are not as simple as you might get off of a meme or that you might get off of a quick sort of social media read. Um, and I think that when you sort of start to explain to them um, the sort of challenges of reconstruction and recognize that, because one of the things you might sort of think about, and, it, and it's a sort of refrain that is popular now, which is that they're erasing history, right? That some of the stuff that's being done, that some of the sort of backlash is coming around uh, memorials and their erasing history, but there's there's a whole history as we're discussing and sort of giving voice to in this series that you all have done such a great job with is that there's a history that hasn't been told on the same level. You know, and it's one of the things I sort of people talk about with Reconstruction. Well, you know, the people who joined the Ku Klux Klan during Reconstruction believed, and, and they believe fervently that the governments that were being created around them were illegitimate. Right. That, you know, leading Confederates, the best men of their society had been disenfranchised right. by the 14th right. Amendment. They had been barred from government. Their property was at the risk of being confiscated. Of course, their single greatest form of property as a region was about $4 billion worth of human enslaved property. And that's $1860, right? Roughly three to $4 billion. Right. So, um, they fervently believed that 
you know, as sort of Jefferson said, that they have a right to rebel against governments that, and that's what they believe. Now, there's a whole segment of the population, poorer whites and African Americans, who had been denied a, a voice in a democratic form of government until 1866, 1867, 1868, and they seized it. So um, that's one of the things I sort of try to convey to people, which is, you know, that the idea is that, again, these sort of competing notions of freedom and competing elements of America is um, at the same time you have this sort of counter-revolutionary violent terrorist organization developing, you have people really pushing the country forward and seizing sort of freedom and rights. And um, I think the same thing's happening now. Well, even to hear you say the word illegitimate, I mean, how much mm -hmm. have you heard that word for the last yes. four years? And yes. that was part of Wednesday's discussion. The election was illegitimate. The um, vote count was illegitimate. You know, this whole idea. So what I saw was the fact that this underlying history that we don't talk much about is very much what the Southern agenda was in 1877 under reconstruction, which was same words, illegitimacy, the federal, inter federal interference in states' rights, this idea that Southerners could better rule themselves, the government was too intrusive, all of the things that we've been hearing and uh -huh. these stories that are, it's just a repeat. So for me, I think this is what happens when we don't do a good job of telling American history, real American history, not just um, the glossy parts that we do for international favor, but to really get under the crust of how America got to where we are right now. And really many of the rights that we all enjoy come from these working class people that Mitch was telling us about. Also this idea of in the COVID, who's on the front lines, who's dying. It's these very same people who are now considered essential, but we mm -hmm. don't pay. We don't pay them anything. We don't even want to give right. them health coverage. So, so th that aspect of the chosen, those who have the rights and privilege to access health, welfare, well-being. Where do we go from here? This idea of Biden, do you think... Um, we're now in a position to have an honest dialogue. I like to think we can do it through programs like this, but I sometimes lose hope. I need some hope. Either one of you, give me some hope, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's hard for me to give you hope after seeing what happened on Wednesday. and People, you know, taking over the Capitol building, one of the sacred buildings, and I can't even go to my car without getting shot in the back seven times. I mean, it's such a, 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 a wide, but anyway, I, ho I hope that we can, and we should have sat down and had this dialogue years ago. Uh, I do a play about about this uh, and, and try to show, you know, where, where, where we came from and how we got where we are, and hopefully open dialogues where we can discuss this and, 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 and be honest about it. And uh, right. that's the only way you're gonna get it done is to be honest, open and honest about what happened and why we're in the position we are and, and stop the lying and the sugarcoating of it. I mean, it is what it is. Um, and also I think language has a lot to do with it. I, I hate the word slave. I mean, if my brother's a slave to, to chocolate, that means he can't, go buy a, he can't go buy a candy store without going in there and getting him some chocolate. We were <laughs> captives. We were held against our will. We didn't want this. It was, it was right. we were held against our will. So I think language has a lot to do with it. The word black, right. everything black is negative. I mean, come on. You know, Dr. King talked about it. Malcolm X talked about it. Uh, a lot of our leaders talked about this negative connotation. And it's, it's a color, it's not a culture. Everybody else has his culture, and, but we're, we're a word. And then people that come to this country, when they hear the word black and go to the definition of black and oh, these are black people, automatically we're negative people, <laughs> you know, so. I think language well, has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Certainly when Langston Hughes, that question, why do they hate us? You know, yeah. it's, I, I was trying to show through the PowerPoint that much of that image of the negativity of blackness uh, 
has been created and instilled in such subtle ways that yes. um, we're immune to it. So even black people, sometimes we're not aware that we're repeating a narrative that was given to us. It was never really ours to begin with, but was created for right. us. And so trying to even get to the bottom of that, of what is authentic when you talk about black culture is difficult. And so here we are now, um, 2021, trying to come up with a language we can't even voice our own discontent. Like I'm, I'm looking at the Capitol, all the people, all my friends around me who were crying blue lives matter, but you have this same crowd killing blue lives in the Capitol with, with, and taking, being very happy about it. So not all blue lives matter, just certain blue lives matter apparently. So, so Steve, we're, we're gonna, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I do want us to talk about the benefits of reconstruction. What do you see came out better for America? I know we were trying to re-implement slavery and we did to a certain extent, but what positives can we point to from this period in our history? Well, I mean, and history in general, right? There, it's always going to be complicated and it's always going to be complex. Like there's going to be the sort of benefit and there's going to be sort of a flip side of the coin. Like the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, for instance, um, abolishing slavery, essentially granting a national level of citizenship for all people in the United States born here, having equal citizenship rights, guaranteeing the right of uh, black men, African-American men to vote. Um, that's a, that's a, a profound shift. Um, it changes the relationship of Americans to their government, that prior to that, citizenship was defined at a state level, um, and that there is a general provision that citizens of one state would be generally equal and have equal rights in a different state. But, you know, Roger Taney in the Dred Scott decision attempted to kneecap that in 1857 um, and attempted to, you know, sort of impose a different understanding. So the Reconstruction Amendments are um, a positive sort of negation, if you will. They use sort of a, a convoluted term, but, you know, they define citizenship nationally. But even within that, there's, you know, there, there's cracks. The 13th Amendment outlaws slavery except in issue instances of people being justly convicted of a crime. Thus or opening the door to the convict labor system. Right. Exactly. The 14th Amendment doesn't include Native Americans. It excludes them from birthright citizenship. And the 15th Amendment, of course, could be criticized because it inserts male into the United States Constitution for the first time. It doesn't include suffrage for mm -hmm. all Americans. So um, I, I, I do... I do see Reconstruction as, as a moment in time, a sort of opportunity where biracial political action for a moment sees the sort of small d democratic gain. Uh, it demonstrates that it's possible. Um, and it demonstrates that um, when cooperation um, is possible, that we can change the direction of the country in the positive. Uh, there are always going to be obstacles and there's always going to be opposition and pushback to that. But right, the classic quote is that the great moral arc of history always bends towards justice. And I think Reconstruction suggests a big push forward and then obviously not as much as perhaps could have been achieved, but it's a big push forward. It's a big push forward and I always like to point out um, given the right to vote but not really achieving the right to vote until what, 1965, you know, sure. when yeah, the Act is passed and so the Klan never right. went away. And, and even though people are saying the Klan has died, I would like to let our audience know the Klan is very much alive um, yeah. and growing. They, their numbers are actually getting larger during this, uh, actually beginning under the election of Barack Obama through today, where people are really joining up in huge numbers 
with this idea of uh, illegitimacy. The American government is being taken over by people who were undeserving, un-American. So I, I would, it would behoove all of us to pay close attention to what we see happening in our environment right now. And we, no one can afford to sit it out. So uh, hats off to women who've been at the forefront of this and the fact that we um, can use stories. We can use what we're doing today to reach out to people. I think storytelling is very non-threatening and everyone has a story. So listening to those stories to heal and reconnect us is, is a good way to begin. This is why I love the work of the International Storytelling Center and what this project does for us. So concluding thoughts. Mitch, I'll go to you first and then you, Steve. Well, I think that uh, as far as hope is concerned, uh, now that we have on uh, January the 20th, we'll have someone in office who will listen to uh, the problems that we have. I think if we, we could start with the sweeping criminal justice and voting uh, reforms, we could transform this United States into the world's uh, leading, uh, from the world's leading car uh, carceral state into a truly multiracial democracy. Uh, we also need to have direct investments into our, our communities to guarantee stable housing, universal health care, high quality education, uh, necessities for achieving a more inclusive economy and greater wealth parity. But, uh, you know, we need to try to understand each other and work together. And uh, as far as I go in my life every day, I try to accentuate the positive. I try to think positive. I can't mess with negativity. I just got off social media every now and then I look at it, but it was just too much negative information coming my way and it was making me sick. So uh, uh, hopefully we can get onto the positive and, and maybe change some people's attitudes about uh, life because the sad part about all of this and the division we have in this country, if there's a catastrophe, it takes a catastrophe for all of us to pull together. You could be bickering with your neighbors for years. You let a, a, a earthquake come through there. You can be the first one pulling them out. And that's, that's the reality, we're human. So we have to understand that we're human beings. We all want the same for our families, for our kids. You know, we just want, everybody wants the same thing to be treated fairly. And that's all, that's all we want. And if everybody could do that, we'll, we'll be in a much better world. Thank you, Steve. A question from the audience, and you, then I'll uh, add this in your wrap-up thoughts. A questioner wants to know, how do we talk to people who still believe the lies? What do you, how do you talk to someone? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, and I, it's something that I, I wrestle with quite frequently. Um, having worked with and support people who do public history, I, I hear and see this a lot of people who still continue to cling to, um, you know, misinformation or distorted information. I think one of the most important, and it gets to kind of what uh, Mitch was just saying, which is, um, you know, it, it, you can have a change at the top, and, and I think, you know, we can all sort of talk about the change at the top, but I think it's the community level that, at, that really these conversations and, and programs like what we're doing here, right, where you're engaging people at the local level and, and on a personal level, often people that you know, um, the people that will come running during a time where there's an earthquake or a disaster, and we can, you know, I, I'm, I live in uh, area near Asheville, North Carolina, an area that is having a tremendous amount of um, sort of trouble due to the pandemic economically and uh, crime and homelessness are on the rise. And you can look and you can see local organizations that are doing good work. And you can kind of, you know, engage people that way, which is find the sort of commonality. You can listen but you also have to find that sort of moment where you can connect them and say, remember, look, this is what we have in common. Um, and and I, I, I don't, I, I've never experienced from my work as a teacher, as a public historian, uh, any sort of success in having a successful conversation with somebody that disagrees with me when I yell at them or when I try to just tell them and shut them off and not attempt to listen to them. So that would be my advice just 
talk, listen, remain calm, but sort of continue to correct and push the correct information in a way that they can understand and listen. Exactly. So maybe it was, they won't hear it the moment you're saying it, but at some point it might resonate. Well, I want to thank both I, of you. I hope so. Well, we, that's all we have. All we can do is keep holding the truth out and hoping at some point, if it's not today, maybe tomorrow, it finds fertile ground. As I hope today's conversation did, thank you both for joining us. We're coming to the end of our time, but I want to encourage everyone to join us February 13th for our next, um, that's Black History Month. We get that one small month. <laughs> But we're doing this for the rest of the next five conversations on Appalachian Black history. So please check the International Storytelling Center website for the details and times, but it will be the same format that you see today. Be, have your questions ready. And if we didn't get to your question today, please feel free to continue to uh, post it on Facebook. We'll try and get back with you that way. So on behalf of the International Storytelling Center, thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Dr. Nash, thank for you. joining today. And we look forward to seeing you. you in February. Keep the peace. Keep the truth out there. Thank you. Good job.